Hey, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of Clinic Gym Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Josh Satterley, and I am uh, excited today to be joined by Greg Jenkins of Monkey Pod Marketing. Greg, how are you, my friend? Uh, I'm I'm great. Thank you. And uh, your listeners can't see you, but I can. And trust me, he is excited. It's, it's, it's written across his face. Yeah. I, uh, we could do that sign language thing where you wave your hands. Uh, you know, uh, That's right. people who are deaf, they kind of wave their hands back and forth as a cheer. And uh, maybe we can do that, but our listeners won't hear that. But I want you to know. Well, for all they know, we are. Yeah. Yeah. We're currently waving. Wh- whoever is listening right now, you, we're waving at you. That's right. Yeah. Now, Greg, uh, you and I know each other because we use uh, some similar software products and you provide some education around that and guide me to be a better person. I mean, that's essentially what it is. Um, But uh, I would love today to talk about customer experience because number one, your customer, your, your company does this great. Um, You're huge, expansive, very large multinational company. That's right. Uh, Yeah. yeah, Does it very well. Um, But also you've kind of had a, a, I don't know, backseat to seeing a lot of companies build out their customer experience or their customer journey. And, uh, and then you've gone, you've gone through it as a very astute observer, uh, what can be done, what should be done, what shouldn't be done. And I think it would make for a great conversation about this because I think in this world of service businesses, chiropractors, physical therapists, gyms, um, you know, just healthcare clinics in general, the the bar is set so low for what the the expected amount of service is that we can just leap over that and become a, a class leader. Yeah. Um, well, I think I should start by clarifying. I have a very modest business uh, of which I am very proud, but mm-hmm. uh, Josh was, was maybe being a little tongue in cheek when he referenced the uh, international global domi- dominant presence that I've established. But, um, but you're right in, in the sense that I do have, I've been really fortunate to work with hundreds or probably thousands of small businesses across my different roles uh, as a consultant or a fly on the wall in some instances to watch like the things that they're doing, the things that differentiate them in their market um, and the things that work as well as some of the things that don't work. Um, so I think, you know, there are lessons abound and I'm happy to, to weigh in on, on what I've, what I've found um, uh, makes a difference. And, and some of those things are big and like, revolutionary for like, you know, redefining something, but some of them are really small changes that you can do that help, you know, you stand out or, or leave a lasting impression for, for your customers. And sometimes that's all it takes to, to change their perception of you or to, to, you know, raise your, rise yourself to the top of mind when it, when it comes to you know their needs. So yeah, where do you want to start? I, yeah. Well, um, for everybody listening, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page here. I think if you look at any company, if you look at the class leader in any company, I can't think of a of a uh, a business sector where this isn't true. The service leader typically is also the class leader. So I'll take amusement parks, obviously yep. Disney, by far and away. I mean, I don't know who the number two competitor, maybe the Six Flags organization. They have m- many more properties, but none of which produce the amount that uh, of revenue and the don't have the national fame or international fame of what Disney parks does. Starbucks, it, you know, owns the coffee industry and they also have really worked on service over things like Duncan, you know, um, I'm trying to think of others, Ritz Carlton for that, you know, that, that name is synonymous with service, right? I'm trying to think of any others where, where you could find somebody. Okay. Walmart is the low price leader and they've certainly expanded that way. But I would say that anybody who, uh, targets any sector of their population or of the products they sell through service probably beats them out over that service environment. I think that, you know, there's a quote um, or a, 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 an adage, I don't know if it's an actual quote that says like people remember how you do something more than what you did. Right. Yeah. And I think that, you know, specifically is really relevant in the service industry because there are other people providing the same service, um, but how they provide it is is oftentimes what differentiates it. And people will, you know, remember the things that went above and beyond in that experience, even if the outcome was the same. The experience yeah. getting there, you know, defined it for them. Right. 
I mean, I think for those listening, if you ask your patients, if you were to ask all your patients, like, have you ever seen another chiropractor in this town? And they say, oh yeah, I used to go to Greg, blah, blah, blah. Yep. What they're saying is that although the product, the service might've been fine, the experience wasn't so much that I anchored myself in that office. You know, as soon as another office popped up, that was maybe more convenient or had a different price. It was like, okay, I'll switch. Whereas, you know, you don't see that in these service leaders, Starbucks, you know, if somebody goes to Starbucks every morning and a different coffee brand opens up nearby, that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll switch. You know, there's a, a, a coffee shop near my house called, uh, I can't remember the name, Joe Max, and their coffee is absolutely delicious. Uh, but the service is just different. And I, I still go to my old Starbucks where I go, man, this coffee isn't that bitter. All right. Bye, Shelly. See you later, Jim. Great seeing you, Trevor. <laughs> On my way out the door. Like, yeah, right. These um, relationships. We are, uh, my partner, Sarah, and I are, are currently home hunting. We are, you know, shopping for houses in the Bay Area. Uh, whether or not we can afford it is sort of to be determined, but we are planning a move and we're like, okay, well, let's check out the real estate market. And I don't know if you know this about the San Francisco Bay Area, but the real estate market there is fairly competitive. Um, so we got connected to a real estate agent uh, who we worked with for a number of weeks to like get our information sorted, get pre-approved for the right amount, and then sort of cast our net to see what we could find. Um, and the experience was fine, but not memorable and fairly impersonal. And the uh, real estate agent we were working with, you know, missed missed an appointment and then, you know, made some excuse, which like, times are tough. And like, I get it. If you like, if your life is is super busy and like, that's okay. Uh, I can be like, I have empathy for people who like are struggling right now, mm. but buying a home is a fairly stressful experience anyway. So Sarah and I sort of felt like, you know what, we don't need our real a realtor to be making it more stressful, right? Like we need to know that this person is on it, that they're replying when we have questions and that, um, you know, they're, they're keeping appointments that we meet. Um, so we, you know, for, we actually had a second realtor that we knew through a friend of a friend and had sort of like capped on the back burner because we were working with this first person already. Um, and so we just made the decision to switch. And it's been, an, it's like it's such a, it's been a night and day experience. And the second realtor has been, you know, proactive, has been anticipating our needs, um, text follow-ups in between calls to like, you know, let us know she was thinking about us or she had a follow-up question or she saw this property that reminded her of uh, us. And we, um, we drove over and saw her uh, to like scout some properties out. Um, and she had hand sanitizer bottles made with her like branding on them. And it's a, it's a one ounce, you know, hand sanitizer bottle. Uh, but it says like, um, you know, life is messy, stay clean, love Felicia or something like that. And it, it sits in the center console of our car. We drove home and, and it, it's still there. And it's been on my mind, like what a small gesture, you know, this, I actually looked it up because I'm ordering monkey pod hand sanitizer bottles from the same company who made hers, a uh, small, <laughs> small US business that I was like, okay, yeah. cool. I can support this. But um, so they're, they're like two or three bucks a piece. Right. And it's, it, it just, it just struck me that like, wouldn't it be wild if that two or $3 investment is what made us choose to spend, you know, $700,000 with her the rather single than, largest purchase you'll ever do. Right. Totally. Totally. And it's, that is, it encapsulates customer experience, right? It's those, those small and incremental, um, you know, uh, milestones in, uh, in an experience that define it for that person. And yeah. that was our first time meeting Felicia in person. The first thing she did was like carefully hand us this hand sanitizer bottle with her sure. branding on it and it left a mark. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think about this, like of all the things Starbucks does, how different would that experience be if they didn't call your name for your coffee? So like, I know yeah. the times when they're like, Hey, I have a large, you know, white chocolate mocha here or venti yeah. white chocolate mocha. And it's like, man, they're like, Greg, your double espresso is ready. You know? Yeah. And what does that cost them? Absolutely nothing. Right. Absolutely nothing. Uh, and yet, you know, that that's a big deal. And even to the point where people were like back in the day when they would handwrite it, you know, now they kind of type it into the sticker, but when they'd handwrite it, you know, they spell right. Greg right. with two G's or, you know, somewhere weird way. And it's like, ah, eh, close enough. It was like a joke, but there they are using your name, attempting to, and of all the things they did, I would love to know like how much that affected their business model. Cause I think it's huge. I think using somebody's name is absolutely huge. 
Yeah. And I wonder if it was strategic or, or like if they knew, like if we don't mm-hmm. use their name, this is what we risk, or if we choose to, or if they just started that process and it worked really well for them. So they were like, wow, like there's something here we've stumbled onto. Let's, let's roll with it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it is interesting. It solves a lot of problems because, you know, let's say that you order a, a double espresso. How many of those are going to be served totally. between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m.? probably 40. Right. Yeah. And so saying, Greg, this is yours. Uh, you know, Ashley, this is yours. Same drink, but it just feels like, Oh, that's the one they made for me. So I, I just lo- those little things, but you know, speaking of that, your company is called monkey pod marketing and the, the term monkey pod wasn't just out of the blue. It had to do with service, right? The, the name. That's right. Can you kind yeah. of share with my listeners uh, why why you named your company Monkey Pod because it's a great story of service as well. Yeah. So uh, in 2014, um, the spring, I was uh, I was in Hawaii with uh, with a group, and we were on a vacation trip. But it was actually like a, a reward trip for for a company that I worked for at the time. So I, as long as uh, along with some coworkers, have been selected to go on this like incentive trip. And we all got to bring our, our plus ones, you know. So we were in uh, the Wailea part of Maui for a week or so. And uh, there was a restaurant in Wailea called the Monkey Pod Kitchen. And Monkey Pod is a type of tree that uh, that is, you know, iconic and beautiful and grows all over the Hawaiian Islands. But uh, the, the Monkey Pod Kitchen is a restaurant that just happens to share the namesake of this tree. And uh, the, the restaurant was like right up the road from the resort that, that we were staying at. So we ended up going there on like the second day of our trip, I think. And um, the the punchline is we went back three more times in the course of that week. We went for brunch, we went for happy hour, we went for dinner. We like just couldn't get enough of this place. Um, and it's like, by all accounts, it's just the restaurant. Like it's just the restaurant that has a menu and has a bar and has tables and has food, like, uh, like very much what you would expect from a restaurant. Um, but there was something about the, the atmosphere that they curated in, intentionally that set it, a, set it apart, that like kept us coming back. You know, we are literally in this tropical paradise where, you know, there are beaches, there are mountains, there is, you know, just beauty, beauty everywhere and experiences everywhere. And like, you could go to a different restaurant every single day and probably not make a bad decision, but something about this place kept drawing us back. And it wasn't, it wasn't a singular thing. It wasn't a singular, like, well, they had this really cool band, right? Um, Which they, you know, they had live music, but um, it was the culmination of all of the small details that they had paid attention to um, with, you know, s- sustainably sourced food on the menu, local and sustainably sourced food, which like makes a difference. I probably wouldn't have, you know, not gone there if they didn't have that. But once we noticed the like paragraph on the menu that talked about the local Maui farms that they're supporting and, and drawing produce from, it was like, well, that's a really cool factor. Right. Um, I at the time was was I previously worked in the draft beer industry and I um, have since developed an allergy to most beer and, and gluten related products. But um, at the time, you know, craft beer was a big passion of mine and they had a really knowledgeable staff when it came to like local beer selections, as well as wine and cocktails and stuff. Um, and I just remember having a detailed conversation with their staff and thinking they know their shiz. They really know what they're doing here. Um, and then, you know, it came time for dessert and they had this, this beautiful selection of pies and the, just the whole, I don't know, the whole vibe didn't feel, it felt personal. It felt welcome. It felt intimate. And I remember it, we had probably been there twice and they had already, you know, had our drink orders and like knew our names and like made the experience feel welcoming, probably not unlike what you're describing at Starbucks, where you feel like you're part of this club. And it just, it left an impression on us uh, to the, to the extent where a year later I was starting my business and I thought I'm going to name it the you know monkey pod marketing in tribute to this monkey pod kitchen, because it's, I think it's rare that you have an experience like that, that leaves such a profound impression on you that leaves you talking about it so that a year later, you're remembering the service from this restaurant. I don't remember what I ate. Like, I don't remember the the specific meal that I ordered. I know it was delicious because we kept going back, but it wasn't necessarily about the food. It was about the experience that they crafted. Um, 
And there's just something powerful to that. Yeah. It is so powerful. I agree. And, you know, I'm just thinking of all, if we look at how many businesses, I mean, you were in a, you were working at the time for a company that, that provided service to thousands, tens of thousands of other businesses at that time. You know, you personally probably went to hundreds of restaurants in that year. You experienced a bunch of different things. And yet that single experience stuck out in your mind where, where you were like, Hey, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to use their namesake. And I think it's funny being, you know, we're in a, fa- I'm in a Facebook group that your company kind of has. And I see people, it, it, your story is so infectious and the service is so great. And now people post up, Hey, I'm in Maui at monkey pod kitchen. Right. And they post in that group as some sort of like um badge of honor. Like I too have gone here and I can't think of something better, a better situation for totally. anybody with a service business. Like if you, if it, if you're telling stories that are so powerful that your friends and, and coworkers, are going, Hey, I went to that same place. I went to that same dentist. I went to that same company. Right. Right. Like, Oh my gosh, you would, you would own it. You know, um, this, this, that's like my, the monkey pot origin story. But the truth is like, there's, there has to be a second bookend to that at some point where I go back, you know, in a monkey pod marketing t-shirt and like, you know, we embrace or whatever. I have not been back. Um, unfortunately we had a trip planned, but it kind of, you know, got, got, got scrapped. Um, but I do, I have been told that monkey pod kitchen knows about monkey pod marketing and like knows that, um, you know, that the, the name story and like, they are super, you know, flattered and, and, and on board with it. Um, and I think, I don't know how many people have gone there on my recommendation, but I know that it's more than a handful. It's, it's, you know, between, between five and 10 people have gone there specifically because they know monkey bot marketing and now they get, now they get it right. I haven't yet to hear a bad review. It'd be great if you go in the bathroom or something, businesses that were named after us, you know, and like your (laughs) stickers there, like 28 other stickers. Yeah, sure. Sure. That'd be hilarious. Uh, But, but what a, what a, what a testament, right. To to what they're up to. And if you started monkey pod kitchen, like what greater compliment can you be paid than to have somebody be like, this is how we, you know, this is the bar we've set. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's naming your business after another company. It'd be like me naming my son after you, because I was impressed with you, your character, your, you know, your contribution to society. I thought, Oh, I always want to name, you know, I want to, that name to carry forward. I think it's huge. Yeah. Is it too late for that, by the way? Is it, is that, has that ship sailed? I don't know. Uh, he's 11. <laughs> So but if you guys would be got willing a few, to contribute got a few to the years, college yeah, fund, yeah. I think it could be about like it. a, yeah, I mean, it's like a stadium, right? I mean, it might've been, uh, make, make a contribution at the right forever. time. Yeah. That's right. right. Yeah. Like, yeah. but you put enough money forward and names can change. We got no okay. problem with that. Okay. You know? Okay. Yeah. And I'll, I'll think like, Hey, my son was, he wasn't college educated. Then he met Greg, that's Greg right. paid a bunch of money and now he's college educated and uh, now Greg, Greg Jr. is college educated yeah. as well. There we go. Worked for Muhammad Ali, you know, started out as Cassius Clay, but he was a champ under Muhammad Ali. And so I it's want you to a, know it. It's just a label. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, going back, Greg, one thing that I, I'm, one of the reasons I want to talk to you is you've had these amazing service experiences, uh, but you also have a pretty deep understanding of of software. And you can kind of tell like, Hey, uh, this is a software that's running in the background, or I know that product because you've, you've, your ecosystem basically has exposed you to hundreds of software platforms. Yeah. Um, you had this amazing in-person experience. It's monkey pod kitchen, but I know that you've also kind of shared with me that you've had some experiences that weren't as good. And specifically, uh, I think you said you had a dental visit that you're just like, this is it's off. It's just not hitting on all cylinders. Can you kind of talk about that? Because I want people to see the, the, the contrast there. Yeah. Um, so I, I did have, uh, I have had like a, a handful of different dentists because um, they kind of felt interchangeable, right? I didn't have a strong connection to my, my dentist office. And like, so you go to one that's convenient or you go to one that um, is in your, in your insurance network or, 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 right. You, you kind of just mm-hmm. swap them in and out. And but certainly um, no, no anchoring qualities to them that you're like, I will, you you lived in San Diego for a while. I'm going to travel back to San Diego to go to my dentist because that's my place. That's right. Um, and 
I don't know that this fits, but interestingly, when I was, when I was a kid, um, we went to a, a, a dentist who was a college friend of my dad's and we drove like 90 minutes to get there. And so as a kid, I thought dentists were kind of rare. Like, I just thought like there aren't very many of them and you have to like yeah. really, you so know, take a day off school. To and he, yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. Um, and only as an adult that I realized, oh, we went there because like he was my dad's you know, frat brother from college or whatever. And it turns out there's a dentist on like most other, you know, every other block in our city. So uh, that was a, a little bit of an eye opener for me in my mid twenties when I realized you could like pick a local dentist. Um, but anyway, the, the point I was going to make is that with this particular dentist, I, um, I remember just getting reminders for my appointments that I hadn't necessarily explicitly requested um, and they came in the form of text messages, uh, but they also would call. Um, and I am the type of person who just doesn't use my phone for phone calls. Like that's, that's I'm one of those people. So I would get voicemails from them and they had, you know, systems set up so that if the, you know, if they called and they said, Hey, you have an, it's Friday, you have an appointment on Monday and the person didn't answer, they would continue to follow up, right? They would continue to call. And for me, it felt, um, they intended it to be a service. Of course, right? They want yeah. you to know about your appointment. And I think probably for, for their sake, like they want to reduce missed appointments and make sure people right. are, are showing up. Uh, sell the seats once the plane is taken off, right? And it's it's probably, it, it, I would imagine if I'm putting myself in their seat, it comes from this place of like, they have found like people don't always come in. And so they want to take as many steps as they can to mitigate that. But I've never missed a dentist appointment in my life, personally. And so like, once I make an appointment, I immediately put it in my calendar and like, that's the end of it. I'm going to be at that appointment. So the, what felt like, I'm going to, I'm using the word incessant, which is like, you know, me editorializing, but what felt like incessant, um, follow-up started to rub me the wrong way. It started to irritate me. And I found that it like affected my attitude when I would walk into the dentist office and like see this receptionist who I know had like called me three times in the last three days um, and uh, you know, I, I, you might be thinking, you might be listening and thinking, Greg, like have some grace, right? Be, be patient. Um, I actually raised this feedback with them in what I felt like was a diplomatic way. Like, Hey, here's how this experience feels to me. I work in automation. So I get how automation works, but like, um, you know, can I request own text only instead of phone calls? Or can I, re can I, can I just opt out of that? Because like, I trust that I'm going to be there. And if I tell you that, like, maybe we can like make you know, mark my contact in your system as, you know, you know, doesn't need follow-up or whatever. And I just remember them, they didn't, they didn't seem to get why I didn't want it. And they felt maybe overwhelmed by that request to the point where they were like, oh, that's, that's how it works. And like, like they, 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 they couldn't see it from my perspective. Um, and it, uh, it, colored the way that I thought about this dental office, which like the service, once I got there, the experience at, like in the chair was totally fine. But there was something about this follow-up about these reminders that like colored the entire experience. And I, you know, I think the lesson is right. Like if you're going to like follow-ups fine, um, but it has to serve the customer also, right. If it's just for you, the business, and like, this is a service that we put into place because it helps us fill gaps, right. That maybe that's fine but does it come at a cost? And what is the experience it's creating for your customers? Because, you know, that might not be worth the cost that, it, you know, the, the gaps that it's filling for you. Um, or at the very least, if you have these automated systems in place, you need to remember that the, 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 the people that you are automating them for are individuals and individuals like to be treated individually. So, how, how can we make it so that these aren't too rigid? How can we allow the users to express their preferences, how regularly they'd like to be communicated with through which mediums they like to be communicated. Um, Cause I believe there are people who are like, just text me the day before, like that's all I need and I'll be there. And it's out of sight, out of mind for them, but yeah. I'm not that person. And so not being able to, you know, give feedback on how my experience was created, you know, felt abrasive, felt, felt, you know, made me feel, it felt impersonal and it made me feel yeah. like, you know, a number rather than Greg Jenkins. Yeah. I, it's funny. I recently went to a dentist and we recently put an offer on a house. Okay. So and, we're the same person. Yep. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> and both of my experiences were very similar to yours. 
Oh yeah. In so going to the dentist thing, this drove me nuts. I went to a new dentist. I promised my wife I hadn't been to a dentist in 20 years. So this is a big deal, right? I go and they called me and they said, Hey, we're just double checking. You know, it's your first visit. We want to make sure. And I appreciated this. And you know where we're located, right? Because they have a brand and it's like uh, I don't want to say a franchise. It's not really a franchise, but like the first two but words. There could are be very more strong. than yeah, yeah, sure. We're the one over, and it's between, and she said it's between Carl's Jr. and Starbucks. And it's like, okay, that's not I know I know exactly what building it has to be in if that's the case. I appreciated that. But then I went in and um the thing that sticks out in my mind is, you know, I was sitting there and they're like, yeah, the doctor will be in 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 just a few minutes. So you're sitting there in that kind of chaise lounge thing with the light shining in your eye. Yeah. And you can't see behind you. Well, behind me and blind, I'm blind to it was a computer and somebody walks into the room and I, and they start typing on the computer and you can hear it. I mean, it's like a foot behind me. Right. And I'm like, uh, and so finally I'm like, uh, hello. Like I, they didn't say their name. They didn't say what they're doing or whatever. And the, and the person goes, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Dr. So-and-so Dr. Smith. I just need to log into the system. I'll be right there. Now, that just irked me because I was like, it's this weird suspicious thing that going on behind me. I'm like, I can hear something happening and like, but I'm not worth uh, uh, acknowledging. And I think that experience just, if they would have just walked into my field of view, which means they had to walk all the way into the room and turn around, which is, Hey, that's the way the room's designed uh, and say, Hey, I'm Dr. Smith. It's nice to meet you. I got to go log into the computer. Just give me one minute. That would have completely changed it because here's where it affected their business. He did an, he logs in. I didn't know who he was. I said, hello. He finally introduced himself. And then he does the inspection of my mouth. And then he says, I need that. I, I need this like filling. Right. And just the way it came off after that experience was he's trying to make a transaction. He doesn't really care about my dental health. Totally. Right? And I was like, dang it. And I was thinking if you want to set up a better experience facility wise, turn the chair around so that the person whoever's in the chair is never blind to everything that's happening, right? But for some reason, they didn't do it. Or if you want to keep the chair in the same location, maybe you don't want people looking down the hallway and stuff, that's fine. Walk in, introduce yourself, invest that three seconds, just like Starbucks calling your name, and then log into your computer. Then do the things that are required technologically, transactionally to occur, right? It's, it'd be like if, I, if you're applying for a mortgage, Greg, and I go, uh, hey, uh, yeah, this is so-and-so from ABC mortgage. Let me get your social security number. And you're like, you don't even know my name. Yeah, but we don't need that. Cause to run your credit, I just need your social. And it's like, that would feel odd to everybody, right? Like that would be a very transactional thing. And yet if you were trying to make the most efficient system, you would not ask for extraneous information. Like, you know, I don't care where, what your name is or what color your hair is. What I care is your social security number and your credit score. So please provide those and nothing else. And it's like, come on, man, the service can go so far here. It's, it's interesting. Um, um, I, I think there's a lot of people who maybe, maybe not in your listener base, but there are a lot of people in my network who don't use the degree that they got. If they went to college and they got a degree, uh, it may not directly, you know, have parlayed into their current vocation. Right. And that's true for me. If at a high level, uh, my, uh, I, I went to Michigan state university, go green and I, I got a degree in hospitality business. And I believed at the time that I was going to work in the hotel restaurant industry. I actually was more interested in like casinos and resorts. Um, but uh, Ocean's Eleven had just come out around the time and I was yeah. real, real but high on the, how it goes. That's, that's so. exactly right. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I, I graduated and I realized somewhere around the time I was graduating that um, hotels, restaurants, um, don't close. They don't like have holidays and resorts are often busier on the holidays. And I was like, man, what am I signing myself up for? So I uh, took a, a different path and, you know, have wound up where I am. But interestingly, the focus on hospitality, you know, continues to serve me in terms of, you know, everything that I do, right? Anticipating people's needs is, is the nature of hospitality and curating an experience is like, you know, what the hotel and restaurant industry is about. And like, you can get food anywhere, you can get a bed anywhere, but like the places we choose are a product of the experience that they create specifically in that world. Um, and it's not everybody does it well, but like that is definitely a theme. And so I think that maybe the, some of the lens that I have comes from that, um, 
that, that, that education in that, in that space. Um, and I, I feel like, you know, there are a lot of other professions like the, like the dentist you mentioned, who would just, um, you know, have, have been well served to have a little like bedside manner, right. A little like, you know, personal touch. And not that that's not, not that that like affects the quality of care you received for your teeth, but the quality of care you receive for your teeth is only one of the factors that determines whether or not Josh is going to come back, whether or not Josh is going to recommend that place. And people, I think the dentist probably doesn't either doesn't see that or doesn't care. Right. Like doesn't, doesn't see that it's more than, am I a good dentist? It's, am I, a, am I a welcoming place for people to like spend their time in what is a vulnerable moment for them? Right. Especially if, you know, I don't know what your relationship is, but a lot of people don't like going to the dentist. And so it's really easy to find something um, to find a reason to not go back. If your experience doesn't feel like it's building trust for you. And like, yeah. I think that's at the end of the day, the trust element is, is maybe the thread there. Well, I'm glad you use the word trust, Greg, because I want to jump into a, a little live read for our software. And one of the things we try and do is build trust. So our software is called Clinic Gym Connect. So if anybody's listening and wants to form trust with their clients, let me give you one example of how I think it's great. Uh, before somebody comes in, instead of just sending an appointment reminder, hey, you're supposed to come in at four. One thing that I think that gets lost, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, Greg, but with Clinic Gym Connect, we can send a text message with a picture attached. Now, a lot of offices are in the back or the second floor or have a door that you're supposed to use. And just sending a picture of where to park or what the building looks like once you're in the parking lot, I think can go so far to build trust. Because one thing that we often forget is we've shown up to our office a thousand times. We don't know that you need to make a right here, not there, and all the alternate routes. And sometimes if it's the first time your patient is visiting, it's not as easy as we perceive it to be when it's our thousandth time showing up. Your so lens sending, is different. Yeah. Yeah. Sending that picture, or I don't know if you've ever been to this, you lived in San Diego and San Diego sometimes has funky parking, parking situations. Yep. Sure. If you just send a picture or a map, an overhead map and say park in this area here or park in this lot, because I remember I was in San Diego once I parked on the wrong side of a building, walked around, I came back and I had a ticket because it was like, uh, you, you're not allowed to park over there, but in the parking lot in front is actually where you're supposed to park. But the reason I didn't park there is I'd already passed the building when I realized where I was supposed to pull in. Josh, you're, you're not going to believe this. Uh, I, I attended, I visited a chiropractor in San Diego regularly uh, for years, and it was probably nine months of me going there before I realized that they had a parking lot. And it was each time I went, I was like looking for street parking. I was like, should I, can I stash my car in this, you know, but the appointments are short, but like how, where can I get away with this? And yeah. only after like nine months did he mention, oh, by the way, we do have uh, these spots available over in this alley. Yeah. And how much trust would it have built if, Early on, you just got a picture of that area. Park here. This is reserved for our patients. No brainer. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, that's one of the features. You can do a lot of different features with Clinic Gym Connect. But if we send those text messages, now, like Greg's saying, text messages get opened. That can work in your favor or it can work against you if you're sending cold transactional messages. They get annoying fast, like what happened to Greg. But if you want to send warm, welcoming, trust building uh, messages, then check out Clinic Gym Connect. It allows you to send those text messages to your patients and uh, have a great experience for their first visit. Because if you can blow their mind on that first visit, I think it's it's huge. Yeah. Hey, Josh. One. Let me let me throw you a curveball here. Um, okay. So one of my complaints, I think you know, SMS as a means for follow up can be valuable, but one fear I have is that as a recipient you know, they can feel, they can also feel like robotic and right. too automated. And I know that especially in a high touch, you know, pun intended um, <laughs> environment, you, you want to like retain that personal element. So where's the line, right? Like how do yeah. you allow yourself to like embrace the power of automation while still like making sure that the messages feel personal or reflect like what you know about that individual? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that is, you do need to balance that. What can be automated and what should have that personal touch? So one thing that we recommend everybody, uh, if we were to send one message, I think the most important one is after your first visit, send that person a message to say, how are you doing? You know, I just want to check in and see how you're doing because it just shows human caring, right? Now, there are a lot of systems out there where 
it'll automatically send that. And then it's like, Hey, Greg, uh, how, how would you rate your first visit on a scale of, uh, and then as soon as you rate it a five, they go to a review site and everything. And I think that sucks the human feeling right out of it. One thing that we allow, or our system has is what's called uh, saved replies. So if, if you know, you're going to send the same thing over again, like, Hey, Greg, it was your first, and it was a pleasure meeting you today. I just want to check in and see how you're feeling in our templates. If you will, it has a big area that says personal. It just has the word personal written there and highlighted. The reason for that is we want you to add in a personal message. So although you are sending a fairly automated uh, message, you just replace that with some personal touch. So in your case, I know you had a, a cat named Gatsby, right? So if you came in and you talked about your cat on the first visit, I could send you a message that says, hey, Greg, I just want to check in and see how you're feeling. Now, up to that point, that's totally automated, right? But the second line would be, and by the way, give Gatsby a scratch for me, right? Now, your experience as a customer is there's absolutely no possibility that was fully automated, right? It'd be, it'd be impossible. It's too, yeah, too personal, right? Right. But it's not so, uh, it's not intrusive or anything, but it does say, I listen to you to the point where I remember your cat's name and I do care. And if you send that out, the other feature we have is the ability to schedule that send. So you could write that right after the visit at 945 in the morning and have it go out at 705. You just set that up in the system. And how does that feel to you, Greg, when you're sitting at home at 705 and you get a text that says, Hey, it was nice meeting you today. I just want to check in, by the way, give Gatsby a scratch, especially when Gatsby's sitting there right next to you. <laughs> it's suspiciously well-timed. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, that's, the, I think that's the point. I see this as a, I don't know how I, I see this as a marketing automation educator where people have this sometimes overt, but sometimes it's like a subconscious fear of automation because they're worried about the experience, how about how it might compromise the experience. And the thing that people oftentimes overlook about automation is that, you know, it's only cold and robotic if it's done poorly, right? Automation can also be used to create a highly, you know, personal, warm, inviting experience. Um, and you, and, and, it, and it doesn't have to be hands off. Um, automation can be used to hold humans accountable, which is what you're describing with a template that then, you know, it's prompted for you, but a human personalizes. Um, you know this about me, but I hand write thank you cards for every purchase that I get. Every new member, every new customer who signs up, I hand write a thank you card. Um, but I use that. There's a there's a step in my automation processes that prompts me when it's time to do that. That gives me their address. That gives me their you know their purchase history, so that when I write that card. Um, I have to do that step manually and I could automate it, but I choose to make that personal because it allows me to add my own sentiment, my own you know personality. It forces me to think about, well, where in the world does this person live as I'm handwriting their address? And what do I know about, you know, Perth, Western Australia? And, and I can, you know, add some, some context, some relevance, uh, some, you know, something about like the course that they bought and why I like that course or what I hope it does for them. Right. Um, and so it doesn't take me very long, but that's a manual step in an otherwise automated process. The, the fact is that it never gets skipped because if I don't send that card, um, the automation reminds me a day or two later, I have those built in steps. So this is an example of, I think what, what you're describing, which is like that hybrid use of automation coupled with like the, the, you know, high touch, you know, personal experience we're trying to, trying to deliver. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that's, that will, for those listening, I think that's, what's going to take over the world essentially of, of service-based businesses when you can do that perfect blend and people feel like you're human, but then steps also don't get forgotten and whatnot. It's huge. If automation, it, do, it doesn't remove you from your business. It doesn't. And people oftentimes think that that's going to be the case, right? But it actually, I have found is it does the opposite is it puts more of you into your business because it allows you to stop doing the things you don't need to be doing and to start and to continue doing the things that make a big difference, right? It's a higher impact for the effort that you, that you're doing manually, that you're delivering and you or your team is delivering manually. Um, and the nature of any automated system, right? Is that ideally it's architected in such a way that it builds the experience you want to create anyway. It's not, you know, an arbitrary system of, you know, uh, bells and whistles or gears that like, you know, churn out so whatever it is. It's, it's something that you have said, this is the experience we want to create for our, our, our patients. Yeah. I, 
I, uh, I a hundred percent agree. And one thing I want to ask you about too, is because of the, let's say COVID restrictions and whatnot, a lot of the feeling, a lot of the human interaction that we could have at some point now has been, it's either illegal or it had to change greatly or the numbers we could do. And one experience I, I just wanted to wrap up with was one that you and I kind of experienced differently, which was um, there's a there's a educator online named Stu McLaren, and he mm-hmm. has a kind of how to handle membership. Now, originally, when you met Stu, you were a, went to a live workshop or live convention with what thousand people in the room. Yeah, something like uh, that. Yep. Yeah, and and it was like meet and greet and people and bumping and here's a let me hand you a t shirt and um, here's the music that I know you're going to hear. And then he was forced to go to transition from that to a. Uh, a like a virtual time. conference. Yeah. Virtual. Yeah. But I'm trying to say that the whole experience had to be digital because yeah. it was people from all over the world, but you know, it's, it, it had to be in a no touch situation essentially, but yet right. he created a high touch uh, feeling around it, you know? So I would love to know what were some things that you saw or that you experienced that you were like, this is a very good digital way to pull that off. Because I know a lot of people listening, here's why this is important. A lot of the folks listening built their practices by hosting free workshops, right? Like, hey, come sure. in for the class. Huge trust builder, right? Like when you come yeah. in and I could stay five minutes after and Greg, let me just ask you this about my shoulder. I just have this one question. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a huge trust builder. And it takes it from marketing to relationship to I trust you. I want to come in. You're an educator. Um. I wanted to kind of feel out some of your ideas or some of the experiences you had so that those folks that built their practice with a workshop have some maybe opportunities to give that feel in this needing to be digital, right? They don't have to stop doing those until we kind of get back to all live. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Stu McLaren is, is his name and he is a, you know, a marketing expert who special specializes in, uh, memberships and membership model businesses or subscription model businesses. Um, and I was, re- he, a few people recommended him to me, said, Greg, you should check out Stu McLaren. And in general, <laughs> I can be a bit of a skeptic when it comes to like marketing influencers or online gurus. And so I sort of put it off and put it off. And then uh, a, a closer friend of mine, um, a, a th- I forget if it was the third or the fourth recommendation, but another person recommended it. And I said, okay, well, like I've heard this name enough. I should really check it out. And so I signed up for his course and I, um, I actually signed up for his like free workshop series and I was still skeptical. Um, but throughout the, you know, the course is 2000 bucks or something, which is more than I have spent on an online course, but I thought it's come highly recommended. Um, I'm, you know, impressed with, what I've seen so far and I'll sign up for it. And it shattered my expectations um, to the point where I, you know, the, the following year I recommended it to like everyone I know. And I became like a raving fan of it, including me, including you. Right. Yeah. Which is like, so something happened there. So there's something powerful about like, how do I, how did I go from being um, on the, the monkey fence? Monkey potted you. Yeah. On the fence, I hope I'd love for that to be a verb. Yeah. Um, I, I, how did I go from being on the fence to being like this, this, this raving fan, right? What happened in between? And the answer was, was like, I, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time kind of unpacking that or deconstructing that. And it's not, it's more than the content, right? Stu is an absolute expert in his field and his course content is, is, you know, valuable and insightful and applicable and actionable, right? Like it, it, it delivers on the expectation that was set um, without question. But there are a lot of courses out there that teach you things. I think the difference is the experience his education is wrapped in. And, you know, for Stu, that looked like, uh, you know, an online community around this course content, a cohorted experience so that rather than people wa- watching the course content on their own, they're doing it, you know, as a group and the modules are released at a specific calendaring or, or schedule so that people get access to the content at the same time and can ask questions, can share lessons, can like, you know, uh, take, you know, apply it to their business and then share success stories. And so it creates this, this sort of, um, you know, bubble around the content itself where you're like part of this, this thing, this club, this, this community. And there's something really powerful and tangible about, about that. Um, it also, I found, 
you know, it, it helped with my engagement because I felt accountable to the rest of this group. Um, Stu would show up regularly and do these Q and a sessions. So as people are going through the content, you know, he's popping on Facebook live to, you know, to do a, a live session. So there were these other aspects of it. Um, and for me, like from an education standpoint, I learned a ton from his course, but I probably learned as much or more from watching how he delivered it from the experience of being in it and the lessons in terms of like, you know, well, why did he do a webinar at this point? Or why did he do, you know, how, how it was the email follow-up scheduled? Um, you mentioned the conference. So there is a, his whole experience culminates with a tribe live event, which was in person the first year that I attended a thousand people or so in this conference room in Toronto. Um, and the energy was just like, electric. I've never been to a concert that, or, or a conference that felt so much like a concert because it, it, it w- was feeding off of this um, course experience that he had created. Now in 2020, when we went through it together, uh, the, the culmination, the, the tribe live event was virtual. And so I was again, impressed at how he was able to translate that, you know, that energy, that, you know, that personality into a virtual setting and, you know, they, they did that through a number of ways, but most like, um, tangibly they delivered a box for like a shoe box, uh, to anyone who was attending this virtual conference that had a notebook for you to take notes. It had, um, you know, a, a, a party hat and it had like different emotion, uh, emojis that you could hold up on screen to like demonstrate, Hey, I'm cheering for yeah, this like or I'm happy for that paper cutout of the emoji. To, yes. Right. Know, yeah. It had some that. adult, adult coloring, uh, book, like, uh, like outlines, you know, to like unwind at the end of the day, which is not part of the conference. But if you're hosting a conference, that's an important thing to think about is like, how will people, you know, decompress at the end of a long day? And so I was just really impressed that, you know, the thought and care that went into like this physical box that showed up on my doorstep to help amplify the experience that they were creating in this, this virtual setting. So I think for anybody listening, I think that's a huge point, Greg is, the box, I mean, you had to pay for the, the, you know, it was like 40 bucks, I think to for shipping and stuff. Box. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, but what that did for me as a, as an attendee was provided structure around how to act at certain points or how to vote at certain points, you know, and even just like the cutout emojis, like, all right, if you, you know, if you're feeling it, you know, hold up your smiley face and you, sure, you, know, you right, see right, right. thousands of people hold up a smiley face. I think for anybody listening, if you're putting on a workshop series, I think sending out that box to people who sign up, if you could pull this off timing wise, you know, have already signed up for like, Hey, we're going to talk about uh, how to get rid of plantar fasciitis. And you send out a box with maybe a, a stretching strap, some tape, a lacrosse ball, like tools that you would use. And you send that, let's say it costs you 10 bucks to send that out. But then when you're going through the course, yeah, I say, all right, everybody, let's grab your lacrosse ball, pull it out right now. Let me show you blah, blah, blah. Now, maybe they had one of those sitting around their house already, but the fact that it's yours and it's in your box starts to provide more structure and a connection point. It's very interesting because we were in a subgroup that you put together. And even in there, I saw those emojis like carrying over yeah. to that. Like, and, and it's like a secret language that we had between us of these things that we had from the conference ending up in our, in our little sub, I mean, there was what a dozen of us that had a, a little group yep. that would meet once a week. And ultra, ultra exclusive, mind you. Oh, so exclusive. Yeah. That's right. Um, but it was just so interesting to me of how the providing of the things that I paid for yep. made it feel so much more like a conference to me because this was also at what I would say is the height of all the uh, virtual anything you want. Like uh, there was a point yeah. in the summer where <laughs> everything was virtual. They would shove it down your throat. And it's like, did you want a virtual tire rotation? I'm like, I don't yeah. even know what that is. And, and so, everybody's, everybody's tired of zoom. Right. Yes. And so like this and conference yeah. was conducted on zoom in a way that didn't make me feel tired of zoom. Yeah. yeah. And they were proposing. All right. So I know that you spent a lot of money, but what we're going to ask you to do is spend two days of eight hours a day totally. on Zoom with people you don't know. Yep. Uh, you're going to be tired and you got to hold up these little popsicle sticks with a, a smiley face attached to it. On its face, you would go, that is as close to uh, enhanced interrogation as we can get. That's torture. Okay. <laughs> but yet it felt so good. And I actually had to take my kids to practice 
I like literally threw him in the car, ran to practice, turned around, you know, basically pushed him out of the car. Practice. I got to get back for this conference. And I'm like, this thing is virtual. Like th- it was crazy to me, my emotional anchoring in that. And I think if any service provider out there could pull that off and refine the experience, you could continue to grow your practice through these quote unquote workshops. And by the way, once you nail it down, it's going to be a whole lot more time efficient to do so virtually and think about how big your exposure could be um, geographically. You know, now you can reach two hours away, three hours away, and people might come to see you. So that's good. I I was just blown away. Um, I'm thinking more about the box that we received and I I know we've got to wrap up here shortly. So I'll, I'll close with this. Um, But it, there were there were tools to participate in the conference, but it was more than that. And I'm I'm remembering the inventory of that box. And there was a um, there was a tribe hat, there was a tribe buff, like a mask kind of covering, um, as well as like a tribe pin, um, like a little like paper airplane or something pin that you would like put on a shirt or a backpack or whatever. Um, and the reason I remember this is because uh, right either right before the conference or right after the conference. Um, Sarah and I went camping, uh, which was like the only <laughs> until that until last weekend's house hunting in San Francisco, that camping overnight was the only travel we did in the last 12 months was like, that was it. That was this one night where we climbed Mount San Jacinto. We camped up there, uh, did another hike the next day and then hiked back down. Um, and my pictures from that trip, which was like a defining accomplishment of 2020 for us, like this, you know, multi-night camping adventure, 10,000 foot peak, um, just outdoors recharging with nature. It was like this really rewarding trip. Sarah's wearing the tribe hat. I'm wearing the tribe buff and my uh, backpack has the tribe pin on it. And it wasn't planned, but it just, it like basically looks like a tribe photo shoot is what it looks like. And so when I reflect on that or share pictures of that, um, you can't help like tribe is a theme there and it has nothing to do with the tribe brand or, or workshop or experience, but it's funny how my brain draws that connection, right? Because of these things that he sent to me because of these, um, the way that they've like shown up as like utilities in my life, things that I could use or rely on, or, or just the pin doesn't have any function, but it's like, okay, cool. Where am I going to put a pin? How about my backpacking backpack? Right. And so it's, it's interesting how those um, are now attached to this activity that we love, hiking and camping. And it makes me think fondly of this tribe brand when I'm in the, it's, there's an there's a interesting correlation there. Even though those materials have nothing to do with tribe, um, it helps build the, the perception I, I hold for that brand, for sure. Yeah. As you were saying that, I was remembering one of the things that impressed me too, that uh, when you sign up, they sent you a, a email with a video and it was like a celebration of you signing up video. Yeah, that's right. Yep. I know that it's one. like a, a point of view. They're walking through their office and you walk into this room and it's full of, it's just full ceiling to floor of balloons and all their employees like clapping for you and, and, you know, holding up signs and all the stuff. It looked like a party, like you're walking into a party. And I thought, man, this is so awesome. I love, I'm so glad I signed up. I'm so glad I opened this email and watched it. And, you know, knowing that there like, literally are thousands of people yeah, around the sure. world that are having that same experience, but I was like that they sent that on your sign up. So it just having those little things, like what is the celebration for those listening? What is the celebration event of somebody becoming a new patient? I mean, it doesn't have to be balloons and, and streamers and everything, but you know, is it the same old thing that like happened to me, like, Hey, I just need to log into this uh, computer. And and so I can tally up how much I'm going to make off of you. And I'm like, God, I don't <laughs> like, I want, you know, you would never do that at a birthday party. Why are you doing that with me in my first visit? And maybe it's, maybe it's just as simple as like, we're so proud to have earned your trust, right? Some right. message that conveys like that as your first experience, because th- that customer or that patient may very well be thinking, is this the right choice? And if you can say like, we realize this takes a lot of trust and we're proud to have earned yours. Like you're putting your health in our, in our hands or what have you. Like, I think that that just goes a long way, but it, like you said, it doesn't need to be a fancy professionally produced video. You don't need to fill a conference room with balloons, but like, what could you do that feels on brand for you and creates that, that feeling for your, your, your clients. Right. Yeah. 
I, I really think that uh, the more we're talking, Greg, and I had the suspicion that experience is going to be the differentiator as we move forward, especially as things, as there's more restrictions put on how the experience can be totally performed. Uh, you know, figuring that that stuff out is going to be the huge differentiator. So. Well, Greg, I know it's, go yeah, ahead, go ahead. I, I want to finish. I'll, I'll give some, some parting advice. Yeah. Um, I know it's kind of uh, customer experience can be kind of like a fluffy term and like, it's hard to nail down what that means, but I, I just think it's worth, it's worth every business auditing. What is the experience our clients actually have like at each step of their journey? Cause it's so easy for us to be like, well, they show up and then they get their treatment and then they leave. But like what happens between showing up and getting their treatment in that window, when they're in the, the waiting room or the lobby or sitting in the, the dentist chaise louds waiting to be, you know, whatever, like let's, let's get really granular in terms of that actual timeline and challenge what takes place at every juncture. And, and the, the, the question you should be asking is like, is it intentional? Is what's happening there something that someone designed on purpose? And if it's not, then let's design it. What do we want them to experience there? What do we want them to see and feel at that point? And how are we, you know, affirming their decisions or building trust or or creating experience that makes them want to like, you know, share it on a podcast, right? Or tell other people about it in general. So, um, and then the 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 second part of this is to do that regularly, is to audit that experience you know, quarterly or twice a year or, or at some regular cadence so that, you know, as you evolve, your business evolves, technology evolves, you're, you're keeping a pulse on what you are delivering and, and you know confidently that it is indeed what, how you want your brand and office represented. Yeah, I think, you know, you sending out those thank you notes, every one of those thank you notes in your business, it's a monthly subscription. Every time you hand write one of those, is that 10 more months of them subscribing? You know, is it... it is that welcome of using a person's name at Starbucks? Does that increase their likelihood that they're coming back? You know, does it double it or, or at least increase it by 25% or whatnot? Totally, yeah. And, and so it makes business sense, but I'll tell you what the other thing, man, it feels really good as the provider <laughs> of those things, right? It does, yeah. I mean, there are tough days. I'm sure in your business too, there are tough days and making those human connections is like sharing gratitude. And, uh, and, and have like, I feel like I have a connection to your business because of the personal interaction. I feel like I have a connection to Stu's business. I've never met that man. I've never, I don't even know if I've been within a thousand miles of that guy. Yeah, right, right, right. But I would recommend him to a friend. Like I can imagine running him to a bar and be like, Greg, this is Stu, man. Remember I was talking about him? Like, you know, and it, and it just makes you so much, it makes the work easier. It makes the experience better. And it really, it just increases every great aspect of business. Yeah. I, I think people want to do business with people and the more, you know, we personalize the experience we're delivering, the more it helps them feel like, yeah, this is, you know, for me and it feels personal and it feels uh, intentional. And um, yeah, that's where, that's where we derive value, right. Is like right. when we can feel those things and it's, yeah. it's. Um, especially for those, for the listeners out there, and especially in a one-on-one -on -one, human to human uh, product, you know, selling chiropractic adjustments or physical therapy or, or fitness classes, it it's one-on-one. -on -one. You can't, it won't be automated. Like I can automate, you know, bill pay and things like that. And so it's even more important there because it's going to be looked at as such a prized event. Bingo. All right. Well, uh, Sorry, I had to mute it to sneeze there. So, <laughs> so Greg, if people uh, like I did fell in love with you over this, this podcast um, and are interested in, in getting some more education from you, can you give any idea what Monkey Pod is and, and specifically what products you educate around so they might have some more context if they should contact you or not? Yeah, um, well, Monkey Pod is a, is a restaurant in Maui that I fully endorse and recommend. Um, and and Monkey, Pod, Monkey Pod Marketing is my brand. Uh, and you can find me at monkeypodmarketing.com. I focus on technology and, and, and systems for small business owners um, in, in all sorts of industries. But the, the common thread is, is I primarily serve Keep users, users uh, who depend on Keep for their marketing automation and email automation. But I'm, I definitely am not 
I, I think the content I produce uh, kind of spans the small business spectrum agnostic of platform. And so uh, I would welcome you know you to check out my blog my my blog channel my my YouTube channel and and you know see what what pops for you. If you have questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. This is the space I live in and that I love. Um, and the the big reward I get is from helping business owners grow um, or reach you know grow their reach or grow their business um, without you know having to necessarily do more manually. I the first business I ran. Uh, was entirely manual. And so I am all about helping people avoid the potholes and pitfalls that come along with that. And the more we can depend on systems and and, and automation uh, to without compromising to, to do that, I think, you know, it'll only serve us. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, uh, for those listening, man, go to monkeypodmarketing.com and the blog there, I think is just a resource on what automations are possible. And I, I can't think of any of them that I've read maybe some of them are specific to reporting in a certain software, but one's about like the, I think you did a great one about automating the production of a certificate at the end of a course or something. I think sure, those things yeah. are fantastic, you know? So um, yeah, I think that blog is a huge resource. So with that, Greg, thank you so much for the time today. It's been, it's been a real pleasure for for me to sit here and talk to you about the customer experience and you are so meta bro, that the discussion of customer experience <laughs> has given me more appreciation to be a customer of yours and the experience I'm having. So uh, I do appreciate the time, but in all well, seriousness, it's, it's great talking to you. Um, and for those out there listening, you know, every time I end these podcasts, I say, go out there maximize the license and live the life you dream of. And after talking to Greg, I think I would say, go out there, maximize your license and provide the experience you want to provide to people because their, their, their life is also being affected by the service or the experience they have with you. So I think it's important to do that. The, the experience, y- y- your customer experience already exists, right? It's happening with or without your consent. And so our charge to you, my charge to you would be to like, make it something you're proud of is to, is to review it, audit it, and then, and then make sure that the experience that's already going on is something that you're signing off on and is, is representing your brand in a way you can be proud of. Right. Like, are you forgettable? And how, how easily forgettable are you? Because, you know, like you said, you moved on from one dentist to another and you might not even remember their names anymore, you know? All right. Well, thanks so much, Greg. I really appreciate the time today. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Josh. This was a blast. Thanks so much for checking out these videos. I hope they're useful. We'll cover things like rehab, exercise, business model, progressions, layout, everything else that helps you build a clinic. So if you're interested, you can click here, there, here, here, or anywhere to get more videos just like this. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you soon.